There is no muscle memory. There is no muscle memory. One of my friends who's a SEAL watched his mother be Here's the front of the brain. Here's the back of the brain. The brain stem is really the expense of real estate. This is what keeps us alive. The frontal brain is your simulator. It simulates everything. It's evaluating everything constantly. Rumors that every, every memory that you, everything that you've experienced since birth is in your brain. You just are unable to actually access all those different memories. And <clears throat> some things we remember, some things we don't remember. Where, where is all this stored? It's not like I can cut your brain open and find some and memories find in there. Right, you know? right. Yeah, there isn't that, that aspect of it, right? So, you know, here's a, a brain model. Well, actually, I'll just keep it together. So here's the model. Here's the front of the brain. Here's the back of the brain, the side view from the right. And we see, of course, this is all colorized, but it helps us understand things with the colors. And these are brain regions, and they all have different kinds of cells, okay? So that's probably as deep as we'll go into that. But here's that frontal lobe up here. All this is actually the frontal lobe, the green all the way forward. Actually, the red all the way forward is the frontal lobe. This is the motor strip. So when you have a thought about something and you wanna do something, I wanna raise my arm up, this red area is gonna start firing up a program. Okay. Think about it like a computer program. You plug it in, here we go. And it's gonna move that arm. So if I'm gonna move my right arm, then the left side of my brain on this motor cortex is gonna say, send it to that right arm and those muscles. So I'll say this right out of the gate because I mentioned another myth that's been debunked, but I'll, I lay this on top of Dr. Andrew Huberman out of Stanford, that there is no muscle memory. There is no muscle memory. No. We use the adage, we say, oh, you know, muscle memory, and I'm not here to correct everyone, but since Dr. Huberman corrected everyone also, I'm just gonna ride on his coattails, because it's really the brain, that's the memory, that sets up the program, you know, the motor program to do something. So it's like riding a bike, right? We always heard that. It's muscle memory. Muscles have no memory. But the brain has a memory program for riding a bike. Okay. Even if you haven't done it for 50 years. And it will kick those muscles into gear, so to speak, activate them so that it starts, and the balance mechanism's like, hey, remember this? And starts running that old program again so you can then carry out that function. Okay. That's kind of a neat one, though. That is interesting. Because we all think that, right? Mo muscle memory. And whether you say that or not, it's not here nor there. It's just, to, it's interesting to know. It's your brain. That's the memory for what you need to do again. Okay. So, front of the brain, you're going to have uh, some of that working memory up here, motor actions. It's really your, uh, I love the way one of the uh, neuroscientists talks about the frontal brain is your simulator. It simulates everything. It's evaluating everything constantly. What am I gonna do? What's, if he does this, what should I do, right? So how important is that in military service? I mean, it's important in every human function. If I say this, what are they gonna say? It's like a chess player here, that frontal lobe. And then we move back here into the parietal lobe. Here's this blue strip is your sensation. Everything you feel in your body. You feel your left hand on your thigh there. That, that's lighting up in the right side of your brain saying, I'm, I have some pressure on that thigh. So everything we feel is in that blue strip. So feeling and motor are right together, right? Because if I feel something on my leg that's kind of pinching me, I'm gonna move my leg quickly, reactively. And so they have to be synchronized together. Okay. And we move back in the brain, we have vision back here, but on the side here is the temporal lobe. That's where the memory, the primary memory, let's say mechanisms are involved in that area, which is kind of neat. So if we take this apart a little bit, which I really love this stuff. All right, so we're looking on the inside here, right? And this round piece here is your emotional cortex, your limbic area. They used to say when someone goes limbic, right? They get really emotional, this limbic area. So this is what's really involved, the brainstem and this limbic area with PTSD. Really? Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is what's called by Sanjay Gupta from CNN. I was just mentioning to you about that. He's their medical person. He was saying this part of, this real estate is the expensive real estate in the brain. We think, oh, it's gotta be the frontal lobe. It's gotta be something really unique. This brain stem is really the expensive real estate. This is what keeps us alive. Okay. This is where most of your neurochemistry is made. 
serotonin, like when people have depression and they're on an SSRI, made in the brainstem, acetylcholine for memory, given to people with early Alzheimer's, made in the brainstem, GABA to relax the brain, or calm the person down, made in the brainstem. So dopamine to get you to do things and to drive and to focus, your vigilance from dopamine, made in the brainstem. When we have a loss of that, now we're in Parkinson's. So all this stuff is made here chemically. And so this is a really unique piece, which we'll talk more about. But this area and your uh, limbic area here, frontal lobe, all involved in PTSD. Okay. Memory, though. Memory. Where okay. is memory stored? So memory is primarily stored in this temporal lobe out in here, the hippocampus. So it's got fancy names, but that's where that processing of memory is occurs and a lot of things linked to it. I'll give you an example. So smell is linked to memory very much. Smell is more through the front of the brain, through the nose and certain nerves, but it links to that. Vision is of course linked to memory. So vision and what you're seeing is, is really recognized in the back of the brain, but then it links to memory. So I walk into our house and I smell apple pie. Oh, man, that reminds me of my grandmother's kitchen. In just a moment, I have a memory that's brought back up into my consciousness through smell. Okay. Or through sound, right? You hear something, boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden, a memory of something comes back in. So a lot of different parts of the brain network to the temporal lobe. And you think about it, temporal, timing, right? Mm -hmm. Temporal, it's temporal and it's, it's way of collecting data. And so to go back to what you said, so I'm remembering in my working memory, going back to, do we remember everything throughout all, every aspect of our lives? I don't know. I don't know if, if they're ever able to cert, with certainty say that we do, but we probably do. Okay. We probably well, do. Why, what is stopping people from accessing certain memories? Well, we know that there's pruning that occurs at an early age, like with your son, as their brain is developing, they have more neural connections, but they prune them back. So pruning, just like you prune a bush, it gets rid of things that are not absolutely necessary for now, for function. So we might, it might be storing them, I don't know. But we know that there's pruning that takes place. It pr you, you have a lot of neural connections, but it prunes them and it makes the, some of them stronger. And that's what we need. We need some connections to be very strong and others not that strong. So maybe that's part of it. Is when it prunes, does it store them? I don't know, perhaps. What about with trauma? So I'm gonna give you an example. In, in, I'm asking you know, for, for women that have been raped, for a lot of the guys that have been on the show, you know, have seen, have seen and experienced a lot of trauma. People everywhere experience a lot of trauma. And I've talked to a lot of operators who've come out of the psychedelic treatment and have accessed memories that they, they have no recollection of until they do that. I'll give you an, another example. One of my friends uh, who's a SEAL watched his mother be when he was when he was a little guy and had totally 100% blocked that out of his memory until he did his psychedelic experience and that all came back. What, another example would be a long time ago, I was, I was doing this anti-piracy stuff. I'd run into a old sniper partner of mine who I didn't even remember was a sniper partner of mine. I knew him very well. We were friends, we've hung out a lot. He started talking about this mission we were on and together had pictures everything, I had zero recollection of that operation, none. Mm. But it obviously happened. And I, I was too embarrassed to, to tell him that I, I don't remember any of this. Well, sometimes, I mean, and you know, we're, we're touching on a lot of topics in that, in that statement. Uh, sometimes there can be a retrograde amnesia from a brain trauma. So you might lose something. And now it may be everything, but you know, previously retrograde going backward. Okay. So it could be something like that, like somewhere following that mission with a head impact, maybe you lost some, some of that memory that was stored there, right? Mm -hmm. um, it also could be the suppression of memory by my own system to protect me, right? So, I mean, 
I talk about this with my wife all the time. There's certain, we'll watch a, a movie that's heartrending and the father's really strong character and talking with the kids in a way. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to watch this anymore. Because I can feel some of that memory stuff coming up in me that I'm like, mm, nope, not going to go there. Oh, God. So in a way, I'm controlling it, but I, what am I doing? I'm holding down some memories. So I think also we know, and I'm not a, a mental health counselor. I'm not trained in mental health work. We work with excellent people in psychiatry, psychology, mental health counselors, all types of people in that, in that realm. And we know that people can suppress for their own well-being. Their mind can suppress things for their own well-being so they can continue to go on. And so it's really fascinating to me after you did your psychedelic journey and had some people on that talked about it. I, I was so fascinated by it. So I started digging into some of the data. And what we know right now, so far, is that, well, what's going on in the brain when you do this that could bring back a memory of something or could help someone feel more recovered, more of their emotional state back? There's something called the default mode network. So again, in the brain we have regions, but we have networks that work together. And the default mode network is a little bit in the back of your brain, a little bit in the front of your brain, and to the, the sides of the brain. So it's this network of connections. And this network, that the, so you have one in the front of the brain, I'll say that first, called the central executive network. It's the front of the brain, all these areas that link together to say, let's carry out this task right now. Then there's the default mode network. It kicks you back when you're like, okay, I'm just relaxing right now. I'm not really doing anything in particular. I'm, my brain goes into the default mode network. So kind of like think about like a toggle switch. Central executive, take care of action. Default mode network. Well, in the default mode network is where we have a sense of sitting back and, and like relaxing, taking things in. Also, it's our sense of self. It's also where we have a hope generated for our future. So there's, think about that. Someone goes to military service sees extremely traumatic things. Maybe they don't have so much of a, a hope and a vision for their future because they just seen so much damage and so much carnage and all the, all the things that they see, they may end up shutting down this default mode network. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.